So, uh, welcome everybody to the first uh, seminar of uh, semester B. And before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to tell you about uh, upcoming events. We have a seminar on Monday the 26th, that's two weeks from now, um, also at 4 p.m. in a room quite close to here, Y4702, by Paul Hutchcroft. The topic is money, politics, patronage, clientelism, and electoral dynamics in Southeast Asia. We'll be talking about the Philippines, Thailand, and several other Southeast Asian countries, Malaysia as well. Um, then we have at the end of the month, on the 30th, for those interested, uh, please let us know if you are, send us an email. We have an international workshop with limited seating called Beyond the Developmental State, uh, which is uh, we're doing together with the Hong Kong uh, Institute of Education, which will be Carol being the and leading organizers of that. Um, in February, we have a talk on Myanmar, Burma, uh, by Professor Roman David, uh, uh, or David, I guess, of Yunnan University, on ethnic and religious tolerance. Uh, not to forget Kelly Gerard's talk in March, on the 2nd of March, on governance, managing conflicts, and ASEAN's human rights instrument. And last but not least, we have a ASEAN Hong Kong Free Trade Agreement uh, roundtable that's on the 18th of March. Again, if you're interested, uh, let us know. There's limited seating for that. But most importantly, we'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Kiara Formiki back. Uh, most of you here will know her. Uh, it's almost fair to say longtime CDU colleague, but at least for three years, former. Uh, Associate uh, Director of CERC, uh, who is now uh, at Cornell University, which is not just famous for its veterinary school, but also for its Southeast Asia program. So we're pleased after she's left us, we're getting over it gradually, <laughs> but uh, we're very pleased that she's back to visit us. Uh, just so you know, um, she is a assistant professor for Asian studies with a focus on Islam at the Department of Asian Studies at Cornell University. So some similarities to the organization here with our Department of Asian and International Studies. She did her PhD at SOAS, School of Oriental and African Studies, a well-known Southeast Asia program uh, in London. Uh, she's also uh, spent time studying in Indonesia, Singapore, the Netherlands, um, and before uh, uh, CDU uh, had uh, experience in these various countries. She was also, while at CDU, uh, awarded a grant, an ECS grant awarded in 2013. Um, I won't go into your research, Kiara. I think that's well known, and you'll be talking about it a little bit here. But she's well known uh, for her work on uh, Indonesia and Shia Islam in particular. But today, to use the words of Monty Python, now for something completely different, uh, you're presenting us a new topic. So we're looking forward to it. Uh, for those of you who are here for the first time, we have about a 45-minute seminar and then followed by questions. So there should be plenty of time for that. Welcome, Kiara, and we look forward to your talk. It's great to see so many familiar faces, uh, former students and colleagues. It's, uh, it's great, and new faces as well. Um, as um, I can take two minutes, in addition to my 45 minutes, to just say that, um, as um, as Mark mentioned, this is um, a little bit out of my usual comfort zone. I am trained as an Indigenous. Most of my knowledge and expertise is on Indonesia. Um, but whilst, and I'll go a little bit more in detail in a couple of minutes, um, being in Singapore and Hong Kong, there were a few things that sort of triggered my interest, especially in differentiating between former British colonies and former the former Dutch colony of Indonesia. Uh, I'm a historian uh, by training, and but as you can see from the time span, I'm sort of reaching into a more contemporary, the post-colonial era. Um, so this is uh, the first time that I presented this project for 45 minutes. It's great. I started this about a year and a half ago here in Hong Kong. There's been a lot of data collection. Uh, actually, one of my most helpful helpers is here in the room, there, and Maggie. Uh, I owe much of what you see here to her and her ability to make sense of my messy um, fieldwork gathering techniques. Um, 
But so it's it's great to have this opportunity to talk more extensively about things, and hopefully it will make sense. We are being recorded, so I'll read more than I would normally read to make sure I don't blabber too much and say nonsense. Uh, I apologize for that in advance. And I'll try to keep time, that's why I keep my phone here. Nobody will be calling me. Um, all right. So uh, again, to give you a little more insight into the project, um, this covers a lot of ground, actually. Um, it is a... Uh, in its broadest of forms, as it started uh, as a GRF, an uh, ECS grant, um, covers Singapore, Malaysia, and Hong Kong. And in the workings, there is further expansion to Myanmar next year, funding, permitting. Um, it looks at policies under British rule and after. Uh, it focuses on legal frameworks for religious freedoms and ethnic minority status. Uh, it looks at education policies on language and both religious and civic education um, in the post-British era. And all of these with the goal of examining how laws and policies actually affect um, social unity or disunity, uh, depending on, um, on how you want to look at it or what policies have been doing. And this, of course, requires assessing social unity, which is not an easy matter and it's uh, what is giving me most trouble methodologically. Um, it's pretty much an endless task. I don't know whether my lifetime is going to be enough, but there is some that I'm trying to present here. Um, rather than flooding you with details, uh, the paper will be ready by the end of the week and will be on the CERC website. So I'll try to, uh, to do more uh, frameworking and giving you so enough to, tr to munch on and hopefully get some feedback. Um, what I have, the narrowest that I've got the project to be, and that's what we're really focusing on these days, is this issue of racializing religious congregations. So it's focusing on what marker, what identity markers the British were using in their census in classifying people, uh, focusing on or looking at the interaction between race, and I don't like to use the term race, but unfortunately ethnicity doesn't quite apply, so I will keep using race, uh, race, religion, and language, and how these interact in shaping congregations, but my suggestion is that by shaping congregations, they also end up shaping society at large. Um, um, so the broader research interest, interest, interest and the broader question is really how do laws and policies on diversity uh, affect social attitudes to ethnic religious minorities? Um, this is, has a whole set of sub questions. Some of some oh, sorry, let's cut one. Uh, see one. Um, some are research questions that are more methodological questions. It's as I mentioned earlier endless, and that's quite enough. Um, in terms of theory, I mean, what is, uh, what I'm really working, working with right now is uh, having as an hypothesis the idea that, as I just mentioned, racialized congregations equal or result in racialized societies. This, by and large, comes from Emerson's work, who looks at um, black and white churches and multiracial churches in the US. Uh, it's very inspiring work. If anybody's interested in the relationship between religion and race, I strongly recommend that. Um, but how am I approaching this? Um, methodological, uh, methodologically, I think there is a structural problem uh, which emerges from census practices. I'm just going to throw you into the hot water, and then I'll trace it all back. Um, there is a structural problem which finds its roots in colonial, uh, British colonial practices of census classification, uh, but also the continuation, the continuation of these very practices in the post-colonial. So even though we are used to think about societies as pre-colonial, colonial and post-colonial, my argument is that when it comes to population management and population classification, there hasn't been much of a transformation or much of a change between colonial governments and independent or post-British territories. And here, all terminology is tricky in a moment in which we put Malaysia together with Singapore and Hong Kong, because each country has had different 
past British history. Um, what is the theoretical endgame? We are faced with, and this is pretty much my, my as any other layperson, realization that these three societies, these three territories, are deeply fragmented along racial lines. Race is a defining matter. Um, we, for Singapore and Malaysia, we're pretty much trained to see them as multiracial, multi-religious societies. And the government implements the, um, implements the policies that retain this pillarization, racial pillarization of society. Hong Kong, we used to think about Hong Kong as a rather homogenous Chinese society with some ethnic minorities. Um, I think that we can take up two issues with that. First, that we can't, historically and contemporary terms alike, it's very difficult to talk about one Chinese society within Hong Kong, uh, starting with dialects, uh, ancestral origins, and other religious differentiations, and so on and so forth. I mean, there are multiple identities that go together with being racially Chinese, and this is why I need to use a differentiation between race and ethnicity. Um, the, the other issue is Hong Kong is homogenous, and the numbers will be coming up. Um, the Hong Kong is homogenous in the sense that more than 90% of the population is Chinese. Um, what we see, and what we'll talk about a little longer later, is what is the trend in Hong Kong society? I mean, is it staying stable, or how is it changing? And in fact, in 2010, we have reached the peak, the historical peak of Hong Kong diversity, the same rate of diversity as it was in 1876, which was the peak of Hong Kong as a global hub. It's multiculturalism and it's cosmopolitanism. 97% of non-Chinese and 93% of Chinese. And this was already four years ago. And things are changing fast. So um, the, the theoretical end game, it therefore, is can multiracial congregations, if the issue, and here you have to bear with me, that the issue is that societies are, these three societies, are pillarized. So we have nation, racial groups, and religious groups, <coughs> which are further fragmented along language lines. Could multiracial congregations contribute to a more integrated, um, setting aside the debate of what integration really means, but more integrated, more united societies along the racial line. This is the broad question, I mean the narrow, broad question, and what I'm trying to uh, <coughs> theoretically engage with in comparison with, or comparatively with, uh, Emerson's work on, um, on the US, uh, and white and black churches, uh, specifically Protestant, that's what he's been working on. Um, So I had um, prepared a little bit on how I've got into this project, but I think I'll further cut it down to a very, um, a very thin storyline, which is, I mentioned I'm an Indonesianist, I was raised in Indonesia, I moved to Hong Kong from Singapore, um, way far out of my comfort zone of being in Southeast Asia. Uh, my first landing spot was actually Causeway Bay, so it wasn't so traumatic as I would have expected. Um, my Indonesian took me very far. I didn't have to deal with non-vegetarian food or food that I didn't know. I got my Indonesian food and everything was feeling very good. I, I felt that I could have something that I could relate to, let's say, let's put it in this way. Um, what, what struck me uh, very quickly was how little awareness was present in the classroom and amongst people who I met about the context in which Indonesians, but also Filipinos, even though to a, to a lesser extent because of the Christian background, Indonesian Muslim population of, the, uh, of Hong Kong, how little awareness there was of their cultural environment and their cultural origins. Um, and most of my courses touched upon Asian history and Asian religion. Um, and it was kind of tangible how little knowledge and 
really it's not about knowledge, it's about awareness was there. These are the dates of the data for the um, for the year in which I arrived in Hong Kong. So three percent of the population being Muslim. Now I want to uh, put this into some perspective because we, we like to think that three percent is a very tiny minority. But how much do we talk about Muslims in Europe or in the US, in Australia? What are the percents? Uh, let me find another page. Um, so, the proportion of Muslims in the U.S. is 1%. Um, in Canada, is under 3%. In the United Kingdom, is about 4%. Now, this is the data for 2011. This is the data for 2013. There is a whole 1% point increase, which, again, seems rather small amount, and... Um, I can see this is not from the census, this is for the yearbook. The current Hong Kong census does not collect information on religious affiliation, only uh, collects information on ethnic uh, affiliation, so or belonging. So this is, um, these are estimates, government estimates on the population. We take it as they are, it's again, what I'm interested in looking at is the trend. So in two years time, we have a 1% point uh, increase. Um, again, second point of curiosity was not just being interested in the Muslim population of Hong Kong, I mostly work on Islam, but the second thing was trying to understand this gap in knowledge and awareness, saying, well, there's as many, proportionally, as many Muslims in Hong Kong that there are in the UK. My former university source has a whole bunch of student societies, the largest of them being the Islamic society. Everybody knows who a Muslim is, what a Muslim does. Some misconceptions, of course, we all have misconceptions about things that are foreign to us, but there is a sense of awareness. And what struck me was the recent end. And the question was, why is there so little awareness and understanding? And this is sort of one of the footings in which um, I came to work on this project. It's a long introduction, but I think that it was, um, to a certain extent, rather necessary. Um, Again, Hong Kong, rather um, secular or non-religious society, religion has been quite present in Hong Kong history. Um, this is just a few dates of major religious organizations or places of worship as it had been established in the first half century of British presence. Um, and again, we see that... Um, it's not just a matter of today Indonesian domestic workers being Muslims, let's say, flooding into Hong Kong, but uh, Muslim presence has, is well established and long standing. Um, this is, of course, not the only element of, uh, of diversity, um, but it's the one that I'm most interested in. Um, being The question, I'll just give you a second to, to look that over. Um, the question couldn't be just about Islam, couldn't be just about Muslims or Hong Kong as Hong Kong being, being uh, so particular or specific. Um, what caught my attention was um, was sort of was the identification of religious identities with racial or ethnic identities. This is something that, as we look into it a little later, it permeates also in the legal framework for racial discrimination, which by extension becomes a tool for religious discrimination, for example. Each racial group has a predominant religion. And this is in sanctioning text from 2009, so 21st century, 19th century policy approach. Uh, that's the bottom line. This is one case that came to my attention in 2013 as I started looking into the issue. Um, so this is a, a Christian Indian, uh, a Christian of Indian origins who lived, who was a permanent resident in Hong Kong. She dies, she gets cremated, they don't know where to put her. Why they don't know where to put her? Nobody wants to have her. Um, the 
she was Christian, so of course she didn't want, I mean, her family didn't want her ashes to be in the Hindu cemetery, that would have made absolutely no sense. Anybody who was a Christian would like to be put, or any the Hindu cemetery wouldn't have wanted to have her. Um, on the other hand, the Christian cemeteries tend to be, there is a Chinese Christian cemetery, there are a number of Chinese Christian cemeteries. That there is a Eurasian cemetery, which is Christian, there is a Parsi cemetery, there is a Jewish cemetery, uh, there is a Gurkha cemetery, um, there is, I don't want to forget any, uh, there is a Zoroastrian cemetery, there is a Buddhist cemetery, um, I'm forgetting some, there is a, there are the Chinese permanent cemeteries, which are not religious, but are ethnic, racial. Um, the, um, the Chinese Church Alliance uh, denied space, um, denied space for Miss Nimala because she was not a member of the congregation until they went to the press. After going to the press and making some noise about it, suddenly she was accepted even though she was not a member of the congregation. The point that I'm trying to make is that there is a sense that the British established cemetery, all the cemeteries that I just mentioned were established during the British era, mostly at the very end of the 19th century and some of them in the early, very early 20th century. Uh, and it was, you either had an ethnic identity or you had a religious identity, depending on what the government thought was your most salient of characteristics. If you were Indian, you were either Hindu or Muslim. If you were Jewish, well, you were Jewish, whether it was an ethnic group or a religious group. If you were Eurasian, you would have been Christian of sort. And so you have that cemetery. And so there was this creation of, um, of a determinant connection between racial identity and religious identity, which, if to a certain extent, made sense in the 19th century where conversion was still limited in the 21st century, appears to make very little sense. Um, what remains today is that the Racial Discrimination Act, in fact, uh, excludes cemeteries and religious organizations from the Race Discrimination Act ordinance, which means if you're a religious organization, you can determine that you don't want to employ someone who belongs to another racial group, as if that made any sense. Um, and I would like, I should hear feedback on this. This is to me something that makes absolutely zero sense, but um, because apparently belonging to a certain racial group might offend a religious susceptibility common to the followers of a certain religious group. But it's not talking about another religious group, it's talking about someone who belongs to another racial group. Enough of this. Um, enough of Hong Kong, I'm afraid. Um, we are in Southeast Asia program after all, and we have rather conservative understanding of Southeast Asia. So uh, I will, from now on, mostly focus on Singapore and Malaysia, but I wanted to give you a sense of how the issue is present, and also the very fact that comparing Singapore and Malaysia is, is almost an easy exercise, in the sense that the histories are so intertwined and common that it's very difficult to make any statement about British policies by fo focusing uniquely on Malaysia and Singapore. I find it very interesting to bring Hong Kong in the mix because to a certain extent it's so different, and yet it's not so very different. And I'm very intrigued to the idea of including Myanmar to this because I, I know so little about it and I want to see whether I'm onto something or maybe it's just a whole um, misconception that I'm having here. Um, yes. So I want to go over, this is what I'll do next, go over some numerical diversity, qualitative understandings of diversity, management of diversity, uh, wondering whether all this is about religion and race, and throwing, throwing in this idea or concept or trying to understand how racial identities were culturalized. So, why suddenly to belong to a certain racial group means that you have to belong to a certain religious group. Uh, Hong Kong is 
way less diverse, if you want, when compared to Malaysia and Singapore. Um, as I said, this is not something that I necessarily take uh, at face value, but numbers are numbers, and that's fair. Um, but as I was mentioning, we are back to 1876. And again, please, my credit goes all to Maggie for putting, taking the data out of all pages of census, photocopy census, and putting them into understandable fashion. So this is ethnic diversity. This is a much more complex um, table, again, Maggie's work, uh, which looks at the breakdown of racial groups along religious lines. And this gives you the first hint. If you look at 1931, which is not the first census, but it's, it was an important census, uh, 1921 maybe was even more defining in a way, but um, you can see some identification, some, definitely some major religious belonging within each ethnic belonging. Hmm? The, the last two points that I want to make about numbers, uh, I like qualitative research, but in this context we need some numbers, is that Singapore has uh, rather strikingly retained pretty much a pretty accurate balance for the past 110 years. So 15, 16% of Malays, now we have 13 and a half. Not such a huge diversion, and if you see it's not a I mean, it's a consistent trend. The Chinese, would accept 1881, yeah? So we're looking from 1901, around above 70%. Indians, around the eight and nine marks. And others, this is, this is a matter of how we calculate others, so that's, um, that can be problematic to just look at specific numbers, but. Um, Malaya or Malaysia, and again, this is, for example, geographical problem where we're getting the data from shows something yet even a, a different trend, which is um, oh, I left some things blank because I was supposed to repeat this. Um, shows that at a time of um, independence from the British, the Malays were a minority, were just under the 50% mark. By 1970, they have, well, uh, Singapore secedes or gets kicked out, depending on which history you want to listen to. Um, we're slightly above the 50% mark, and by 2010, we're way towards the 70%. Uh, this is what I think we can refer to as an attempt to homogenizing society within Malayness. And the only way, because arguably you can't change your race, because race is determined by the race of your father, and that is understood in phenotypical terms, not in cultural terms, uh, especially when it comes to, um, to Malaysia. The only way in which you can have such a transition, besides population policies, but that's not quite the point here, is towards um, advancing conversion policies, uh, conver a conversion project of indigenous populations who are not originally Malays, but by becoming Muslim, can be assimilated as Malays because they are also indigenous people. And by indigenous people here, I'm referring to the term Bumiputra, the sons of the soil. So the Iban, the Kadazan of uh, Sabah and Sarawak, they are invited to convert to Islam, and then they were, and this is a very political issue, in some cases invited to change their race category on the ID to become Malays. Now this, again, it's, it goes in different ways. Sometimes it's pro-Malayization, sometimes it's against Malayization, but the trend is quite clear. What I'm interested here, interested in here is the, 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 the racial transformation by a religious conversion. Um, so how do we understand um, diversity? Um, this, is, um, this is Singapore, it's an old map of Singapore. Um, just giving you a short snapshot, this is 
represents the Jackson plan, according to which the newly emerging, so-called newly emerging British trading hub was to be um, was to be planned according, and was then planned, according to a very specific grid of urban planning in which each racial group was filling a certain geographical area of the town. With the Europeans having the best share, the Chinese being close enough to the river because of their own commercial activities, the Indians being another area, and the Malays being around the southern parts, because most of the Malays were either involved with uh, agriculture, and so they would have sort of the back, the most inland part, or they were involved and um, attached with the Sultan Palace, and therefore they would have easy access. Um, the, the logic behind dividing the city along ethnic lines were um, well, at least probably two reasoning. One, um, and here I'm quoting, uh, one, one was a commercial economic reason. So I quote, a line must be drawn between the classes engaged in mercantile speculation and those gaining their livelihood in handicrafts and personal labor. This is from a letter between Raffles and Jackson. Um, the, the second reasoning was the conviction that people of different races couldn't get along. So you had to divide people so that they would not get into fights. Um, this was not unique to Singapore. Um, was uh, I don't have a map, I apologize for that. Uh, KL was built pretty much in the same way as the early, well, as a later colonial capital um, in the, um, well, since the late 1800s, early 1900s, they had a European section, a Chinese section where the population was uh, housed in uh, shop houses, and the Indians were, if they were, Southern India, they would have been employed in the railway activities, uh, a railway building, and so their housing barracks were next to the um, to the build to the railway facilities. And if they were from northern India, they would have been employed as white collars, and their barracks would have been in a different section of town. Again, the distinction between northern India is very northern and southern India is very interesting. It goes back to the idea of the Dravidian Indians and Aryan Indians, and as Aryan Indians from the north being more sophisticated because of a lighter skin color, and the southern Indians being darker, and, um, uh, sorry, the Dravidian Indians having the Aryan in the north, yes, uh, and therefore having to be put in manual work. Um, this goes back to the discourse on uh, social Darwinism, et cetera, et cetera, I have no time for that. But um, Hong Kong, to a certain extent, also had a similar geographical organization of the city with the Europeans on the peak, uh, the Chinese on the coast, uh, sorry, the, the Chinese with shop houses between the peak and the coast, and the Indians on barracks in very specific strategic areas where the forts were held. Uh, and no interaction in the residential areas was supposed to be. Um, the first time that we see a Chinese uh, having a housing resident permit in the peak was early 1900s, I think it's 1904 or 1907, uh, and actually it's a Eurasian. Um, so we have, um, there is a very clear division. Um, why so much um, about this? Whoops. Diversity. Um, I mentioned I wanted to try and understand in what way we see diversity besides numbers. Um, Furnival, uh, he was a Dutch, uh, sorry, he was, a, uh, he was an English officer, colonial officer who traveled throughout Southeast Asia, most notably Dutch East India, Malaya, and Burma, and in their 40s, and in 1945, he publishes, um, publishes a quite seminal book in which he talks about uh, Southeast Asia's plural societies. And by plural societies, he simply refers to diversified, different societies. I mean, a society that has the Chinese, the Indians, the Malays, as groups that occupy the same space but actually never interact. And this is his idea of pluralism. And uh, this is sort of what I would like to refer to as a theoretical window, in the sense that the idea of pluralism has, um, has evolved much um, in the 
they say in the 50, 60 years that the virus from, uh, separates us from animals. And today we can, take, we can talk about pluralism in a much more sophisticated way. So Michael Pellet, who works actually on gender pluralism, refers to pluralism as diversity, yes, but diversity which is accorded legitimacy. So in Farnival's case, we have a bunch of different people who sort of occupy the same physical space but do not interact. And that's what physically or uh, on an urban level we, we see with the planning of Singapore, KL, and Hong Kong. But in a qualitative space, they are each in their own sphere. What Palace is talking about is that that's not quite pluralism. That's de facto diversity. You have different people of different races and different religious groups that live in the same city or the same state. All right, what about that? I mean, what, what does that say about the quality of the interaction? The quality is zero or is mere toleration. But that's quite intriguing idea is the fact that it implies legitimacy, which is even is well beyond toleration, is I think is a concept that is even more, more interesting than integration, because it really integration has become a hollow policy word, like multiculturalism. What does it really mean? This idea of according legitimacy points at recognizing others' differences and saying that is okay to me, and getting along and interacting on that very principle. Um, so as anticipated when I was elaborating on the core question of the paper um, and the broader research goals, uh, my concern here is really in determining, uh, sorry, is, is really in, uh, in determining whether current policies uh, are directing societies towards a Palatian uh, pluralism, plural pluralistic reality, rather than just managing and keeping people separate. So managing the diverse, the different groups, each in its own space. So what are there is a whole bunch of policies, and as I mentioned, I look at uh, education policy, language policies, and um, I, I mean, three hours wouldn't be enough to go all, over everything. Uh, I want to focus on legal frameworks for religion, and again, very briefly. And this, forgive me, is an absolute simplification, um, or the details will be in the paper. Um, bottom line, well, bottom line, <coughs> Malaysia and Singapore, and Hong Kong for that matter, on paper are secular states. What does that really mean? It means a different thing in every single place. Um, what I am, what I'm interested again here is in what is the relationship between race and religion. Malaysia, we understand it as a place where Islam has a special place. Singapore, to a certain extent, also is a place where Islam has a special place, even though Muslims are a minority. And the reason is the same reason for which Malaysia has a special place for Islam which is, the special place is not for Islam. The special place is for being Malay. As an extension, it becomes special protection for Islam, or special institutions for Muslims. The key aspect, and here you will have to sort of take my word for good in a way, is that there is a difference there is a very deep difference in both Malaysia and Singapore between being a Malayan Muslim or an Indian Muslim or a Chinese Muslim or an Arab Muslim. Because these things historically meant different things. And today in practice mean different things. When we talk about Malaysia becoming an Islamized state or possibly or having Islam law, that's a partial truth. What it has is, is a Malay Muslim state, has Malay Muslim law. Muslim laws that in many other places of the world wouldn't fly. But not just that, laws that wouldn't necessarily apply to an Indian Muslim who has been in Malaysia for five generations. Because most Malay Muslims are Shafi, and a lot of the Indian Muslims are actually Hanafis. And some of the Arab Muslims may be a whole bunch of other, I mean any of the four, uh, schools of thought. And so the very provisions of Islamic law that you find in Malaysia 
do not even apply to all of its Muslim populations. It only applies in reality, in a, from a theological, religious point of view, only apply to the Malay Muslims. And this, I mean, I don't think that this is discovering hot water. I mean, I don't think that this is, um, I mean, this is, is almost quite self-evident, but it is a Malay privilege, it's not a Muslim privilege. But why, again, there is this perception that it is Islam per se, rather than Malayness as being protected. Or thinking about anti-propagation laws, and specifically the ban on the use of certain words by non-Muslims, more emblematically the word Allah, for God, in um, Malay language Bibles. Is that to protect Islam? Yes, it becomes, to a certain way, a protection of Islam. But the way in which anti-propagation laws started were very much a protection of the Malay community as a homogenous, original majority that had become a threat, almost a threatened minority. The Religious Harmony Bill in Singapore um, emerges more or less at the same time as the anti-propagation laws um, in Malaysia, is often explained as the Singaporean government making a step, taking a step to protect its Malay slash Muslim population from um, Christian Crusade, a movement that was uh, very strong in schools, university campuses in the late 80s in Singapore. Uh, an interesting counter interpretation to that is actually that the Singaporean government was also protecting the Chinese population from being fragmented. Much of the, of the, of the discourse that I've heard, and this is more the ethnographic part or the uh, historical part, that I've heard today amongst young Chinese Christians in Malaysia and Singapore is the pressure from pastors to drop Chinese traditional um, worship and, uh, and the young people mentioning how their parents are concerned about this and being in constant tension with their parents because their parents who might have not converted yet actually fear that nobody will take, will make proper burial practices for them when they pass away. And so it is protection of religion, but it is the protection of religion because religion had become a key marker of how a racial community bonded together. And of course, we can look at this probably from other 10 different points of view, but I'm trying to bring water to my own uh, meal um, and strengthen my own argument. But um, the, the reason behind the Religious Harmony Bill is, uh, is referenced here and there, but it's not, um, I don't think it's given much importance or how, how um, threatening it was to the Chinese and still is to the Chinese community having to drop, especially in the new evangelical um, new evangelical Protestant groups, the need to drop uh, Chinese practices, uh, ancestral worships. Um, so this is, this is the ultimate question, how much is this about, um, how much is this about race and how much of it is about religion? Um, in, to summarize, I mean, the provisions that I mentioned there were um, briefly listed there, um, that which have allowed for the institutionalization of Islam as part of both the Singaporean and Malaysian states, had actually their origin in the enhancement and protection of the Malays. So a very specific uh, racial group, not Muslims in general. Um, Besides from the very fact that um, it's not just about Malay Muslims versus Chinese Muslims or Indian Muslims to be privileged or protected, it's also what kind of Islam. And so we have the whole issue of Shia Muslims and Ahmadi Muslims who are not seen and perceived and treated as Muslims uh, at all. Um, I, I need to uh, move on a little bit. But then,
what I, I want sort of to conclude with is in the last five, seven minutes maybe, um, is why are then religious identities understood, understood as an aspect of racial identity or experienced as such or institutionalized as such? And there are many other examples that I could give you about how um, they are intertwined. Maybe you can ask me questions in the Q&A and we can discuss that. Um, this is where this is where the good old British officers and their deep insight comes in very handy. Um, so the, the reports, the 1921 and 1931 censuses were most defining for understandings and debates, internal debates on race and religion within the British Empire. Um, so and I think this quote from Leland is uh, quite telling on seeing how the British understand the interlock between race and religion. So most Oriental peoples have themselves not clear conception of race and commonly regard religion as the most important, if not the dominant element. The Malay, for instance, habitually regard, regard adherence to Islam in much the same light as a European regards a racial distinction. And we speak of Mohammedan Indian and a Hindu as though the distinction between them were similar in nature and magnitude to that between a Frenchman and a German. What is interesting is that Villon continues uh, by reflecting on the indigenous usage of the uh, Jawi Pekan label. It was another label which, which was not Indian and was not Malay, which actually identified a Muslim Indian who marries a Malay woman. So this is someone that is a Muslim, ethnically is an Indian, and marries a Malay woman in virtue of the fact that he is a Muslim and becomes affiliated with the Malay, his ethnic group actually changes. His racial classification changes to being one sort of Jawi, a kind of Malay, in a way. Um, so we see that assimilation happens through religion and through marriage, even though it's not in, in a traditional Malay sense, Race is not phenotypical. Understanding of race is not race, it's community. It's what we today we would define as ethnicity, not just as a physical characteristic, but a cultural characteristic. And there was much uh, transformation. Another um, quote that I am uh, that I'm quite fond of. Um, oh, sorry, it's not this. Um, well, hmm. okay. um, another answer that I'm very fond of is the treatment of Chinese Muslims and um, British officers being very concerned about how there were not enough Chinese Muslims responding to the census. And clear was because they spoke Malay, they wore Malay dress, and they deceived the most experienced of uh, enumerators in portray themselves as Malays as opposed to Chinese, whereas they should have been Chinese on the census. But because they were so assimilated, they were not able to deter to separate them. So what I'm what I'm getting at here is an absolute British obsession with racial classification and the fact that as a Chinese Muslim you were a problematic subject because you didn't fit in well, you would have fit if you admitted that you were Chinese, but in a moment in which you don't admit that you are Chinese, then what do we put you? I mean, this is this creates a number problem. And uh, because people's identity should just be following some sort of uh, very clearly defined checking boxes. Um, this uh, brings me to the second theoretical window, which is Brew Baker, uh, Brew Baker's work on ethnicity uh, without groups. Um, and the idea is that I think he calls them ethnopolitical entrepreneurs, create, such as colonial officers, census officers, create categories that us as researchers and people who analyze the data tend to take at face value as actual categories without considering the fact that these very categories have been created artificially. And so he's not saying take the categories and throw them out of the window but analyze them as such and think about groups not as a fixed element 
rather as malleable or constantly changing variables. Again, a very inspiring book for anybody who's into ethnicity studies. Um, um, so we end up with race becoming a determinant um, a determinant for religion. Um, this is a comment from the 1921 census, and um, it's, um, it's a tricky part, in the sense that the number of non-Mohammedans amongst the Malays are so small that the census committee recommended that the only tables to be published in this report should be those dealing with the Chinese and the Indians. From 1931 on, the British stop asking Malays what their religion is because the Malay population probably is universally and the whole Malayan population almost entirely Mohammedan, Muslim. Therefore, we might as well, as well not ask them and not give them a chance. This is 1931. By 1957, we have the sanctioning of Malay identity as including being a Muslim. Something that emerged, and this goes back to what Brubaker said, was uh, argues, is that categories are created through political practices. And at some point, they need to be deconstructed in order to properly analyze the phenomenon that we have at hand. I keep showing this image because I think this really visualizes how we end up with stratification of identities and ultimately the creation of churches and mosque, uh, mosque congregations that are linguistically and racially defined below the, below the religious umbrella. So you go to a church in Singapore, in Malaysia, and to a certain extent also in Hong Kong, and you will know from the outset whether it is, not even whether it is Indian or Chinese, but whether it is Malayali, Telugu, or Tamil, whether it is Fu Chao, Hokkien, Cantonese. And it's the same with mosques. You go to a mosque and it will be either majority Arab, majority Malay, majority Indian, and the sermon by and large is in Malay, we're talking about Malaysia and Singapore, but there are some mosques in Singapore and Malaysia that give their sermons in Tamil. And this creates, again, going back to what Emerson argues, is that our first, I mean, for people who go to places of worship, the first point of interaction and socialization is the church, the mosque, the temple. This is how social networks are created. These are how children socialize besides schools. And this brings my issue with education, which I didn't have time to talk about here. But the very fact in the moment in which we have religious congregations that are so fragmented along micro-identity markers, it reinforces or it, uh, sort of um, it um, reproposes the polarization of society that we already have at this point in the 21st century as a consequence of British policies. So it's sort of a, um, it's a dog that bites its own tail. Um, in conclusion, um, what Emerson is suggesting is a, is a sixth American. And what here we will be trying to look at, or my my very tentative argument is the search for the fifth Malaysian or the fifth Singaporean, which is the one that does not fit in, into one specific category, in, or rather, is someone who is identifiable as Chinese, Malay, Indian, or any of the others, but socializes, interacts within the religious sphere and therefore in society with people who belong to other groups. Uh, again, Emerson's study comes from the black and white 
churches and the Latino churches and the Filipino churches and the Chinese churches across America. But it's very much the same idea of how, to, how could congregations be a first place and agent of change in racialized societies. Um, this is his uh, definition of the sixth American. Um, what I am, what I'm looking at, and this is, uh, I just collected data last week, and so I'm still going through it, is looking at interracial marriages within religious groups, and in a much depressing, at times rather depressing fieldwork, having to go to Chinese churches or Indian churches or expat churches or walking in front of a mosque and not in that is absolutely homogenous. Um, I went to, to the Calvary Church outside KL. Um, I'm not Catholic, I'm not Christian, but uh, it was an appalling sermon, which everything was about money. You go to church, you are devout, you will get more money in your pockets, which is not my understanding of spirituality and religion, but um, that said, and I was, I was shocked, I endured for two hours. What I found fascinating was that the, priest, the priestly couple was a Chinese lady with an Indian husband. They had a son who was going to take over the church at some point. The congregation was absolutely mixed. And then they had the benediction of young children that don't believe in baptism, uh, of unaware individuals. Um, and a lot of them were mixed couples. And this is very interesting. This is a change that you don't usually see on the streets of Kiel. And you see going into a church of nut jobs. Um, but it, it, was, it was interesting, and I think that this is onto something. So I'm analyzing, this is just data for the, analyze the Muslim acts. So these are the Muslim marriages. So these are ethnic, uh, inter-ethnic, uh, non-religious marriages, right? And this is just the Muslim. So you see how much higher it is. And I am going through more data about other religious uh, religious groups on seeing how inter-ethnic marriages works out. Uh, I will stop here because I always set my banner already. Uh, thank you very much for your patience. Thank you very much, Carol, for that wide ranging talk. I'm sure there will be questions. We still have uh, plenty of time for that. Um, my question concerns the role of um, power. Um, I think uh, the religious and ethnic policies in Malaysia and Singapore are closely related to the political mm -hmm. uh, system maintaining uh, power by the regime. And I think those in Malaysia even more with these multi-ethnic um, uh, institutions. Yeah. So I want to know more a little bit about uh, the role of power. And, uh, and in, in, you mentioned the Religious Harmony Act in Singapore. Mm -hmm. And uh, as far as I think, it's mostly related back to the 1987 Marxist conspiracy, the so-called Marxist conspiracy, in which uh, mostly Catholic uh, social activists became politically active, and uh, the idea that politics could become an independent political force in Singapore was worrisome to the leaders. Uh, and they tried to say that politics and religion need to be separate, so they can talk about politics in church or so, and war become a force. Thank you. Um, so, of course, the, the connection between maintaining power um, is key to understand religious policies in Malaysia. Um, and that goes even, in a way, I mean, we want to take the, for good the issue of policies on Islam not really being about Islam but being about Malay, then we can also go further down and say actually it's not about Malay privilege, it's about Amno voters and Amno open supporters privilege. And that's that's a huge part of it. And I think that that's thinking in terms of the Borneo, or sorry, Sabah Sarawak, Iban and Kazan also plays I mean, Invited conversions, we can't talk about forced conversions, but invited conversions um, plays, um, again, plays a key role in saying, you know, there are benefits for being Malay. To be Malay, you have to be Muslims, but then, of course, it becomes, okay, now you converted, now you, we put a Malay on your ID. 
but now you have to vote for us. That's the way. And so there's, that is a key thing. But I don't think that it's maintaining power on, nor on a religious, neither on a religious, uh, religious aspect, nor on an ethnic aspect, actually, because otherwise it wouldn't have the constant scheming and fighting between past and unknown in a way, so it's, it's really about how to how to get poor people to vote for, I mean, how to get people to vote for um, no, let's get the most disenfranchised, let's give them something in exchange of votes. That's, I don't know, that's my very bleak understanding of Malaysian politics. Um, I don't know what it is, a very well-rounded answer to the question. But, um, the Religious Harmony Act. Yes, the Marxist conspiracy was part of it, but I heard quite a few people who were active in the late 80s who were very skeptical of that interpretation of um, the Religious Harmony Act being promulgated because of the Marxist conspiracy. I mean, the very fact that a lot of people question whether it actually was a Marxist conspiracy to start with. Uh, well, exactly, I mean, what, what does that even mean? They would have the, the ISA, in a way, in order to tackle that. So why did why was there a need for an additional piece of legislation? Many argue that the Religious Harmony Act is just a second embodiment of ISA, just more subtle and easier to deploy. Um, but I found, what I find interesting about that is the possibility of reading that not just as a gift to the Malays, or not just seeing LKY as giving in to Malays' requests, I mean, really? Would that ever happen? But actually protecting the interests of his own voter constituency, which was the 1965 generation, which as non-religious it was, surely he strongly believed in Chinese values. And it, it, I mean, we can't even argue about it. Asian value, fear piety. And I, I found that resonated with contemporary dynamics between younger generations of converts and the issues that they face at home with their parents about um, really uh, funeral rites and what is going to happen when the parents pass away. Um, I assisted a very tense relationship between a preacher and his assistant, and she said, well, yes, my parents are really annoyed at this, and the preacher trying to, to mask that as saying, but no, of course, if they die, you can, you know, you can pay respect, but she wasn't convinced by that. It didn't feel right, in a way. So it's just I like it as, a, as an additional voice to the debate of why it was a religious act in uh, acts necessary. Paul? Mm. Mm. Okay, well, I, I should apologize because I, I don't understand the religion of Islam. Mm. Well, I particularly don't want to offend anyone, but I don't understand why anyone would convert to another religion. Mm -hmm. that, that to me is a totally irrational, bizarre thing to do. So I've, so I've got a deficiency in understanding all this. My question is what was the attitude of the, you know, the colonial period towards proselytization? Did the British authorities encourage it, or did they actively support it, or, or did they discourage it? Mm -hmm. And what's your take on the relative... Uh, how much conversion is there these days compared to then? Is there more proselytization, more conversion? In which case, I'd be quite pleased, because I also don't believe in the idea of modernity and modernization. Mm -hmm. As moving out of religion. So that's my question. Mm -hmm. um, there are many reasons why people convert, but um, without going into that, exactly. Um, so the, the British had a, I mean, the British as a Dutch, they had an ongoing, changing approach to how much space to give to missionaries, because missionaries were always infringing on the authority and the territory of the colonial power. So it's, that was a very tricky relationship. But that said, there were missionary missions, um, going into the, the rural areas of Malaya, um, and there are some quite fascinating accounts of um, priests who were facing problems in converting, but they were facing problems in the sense that they could very easily convert one or two people and bring them in their convent or in their structure. The moment in which these people were re released in a while, um, back to their villages, they, because of social pressure, these people didn't want to be ostracized and therefore reverted to Islam. And we're talking about Malay Muslims, generally speaking, but of course they were the 
animus. It was plenty of people who had uh, followed different forms of spiritualism or animism. And again, it was the same problem. It was not it was not difficult for missionaries to make new records, but it was the retention rate was was very low. And this, I think, was connects quite well with the issue of anti-propagation laws more broadly and apostasy laws being not necessarily much about religion or theology as much as racial identity in the sense that, and this might be seen a little bit as a stretch, but the point being, we are used to think about apostasy in Islam as being uh, a sin, which is true. Not less it is in Christianity, if you go to the scriptures. And in any other religion, stepping out of your religion is perceived as a negative act. Of course, you're stepping out of the religion. You're going into another one. So it goes without saying. Um, what, so the, the stigma of apostasy is not losing your religion. The stigma of apostasy is stepping out of your community, of your family, and the people that have raised you and have surrounded you. You gain a new family, but the stigma remains because you have crossed the boundary. Um, and I think that, again, it goes back to this idea of community as a much broader understanding that it goes beyond just a mere label of which religion you belong to. It's a long-winded answer, but um, there were mixed approaches to proselytization. There was much going on. Um, today, it's illegal in Malaysia for um, uh, Muslim, for Malays to convert out, uh, to convert into anything else. It's allowed in Singapore. There are people who do it. It's not, as far as I know, it's not very widespread, but it, it does happen. Um, there are quite numbers of Chinese who convert to Islam in Malaysia, uh, and the numbers are soaring. I do have a table somewhere with all the numbers. I'm talking about maybe a thousand in some states every year. I mean, it's these substantial numbers in proportion is not that much, but it does happen. And that's one of the other ways in which the, um, in which the Malay contingent has augmented, even though not all Chinese become Malays. And that becomes a very, goes back to the issue of power, becomes a very ad hoc situation. I mean, in, in theory, you can apply to become Malay if you're a Chinese convert to Islam. But it depends on whether the bureaucrat in front of you actually approves your application or not. By law, you can, but it depends. Maybe if you vote for AMNO, you get a yes. It goes back. Yeah. Thank you. Well, there are no other questions oh, at all. Okay. I'll try. Oh, sorry. I'm uh, just saying oh, a comment and a question. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, just what everything you've been saying about Malaysia is, is just incredible. It's just you could put Myanmar there and replace Islam with Buddhism. I mean, it's just, I mean, even now there's on the table, there's uh, in Parliament, they're trying to put an anti, anti-marriage anti law prohibiting yeah. Buddhist women from marrying Muslim men because they, the, the Buddhist community would see that as a betrayal of their Burmese et identity, ethnicity, and they see that as Islam's way of proselytizing in a in more insidious way of mm -hmm. proliferating children. Uh, to, to quote, take over the country from the, to get rid of the, from the, the Buddhist Burmese identity. But so that was just surprising with that. And one quick question was, um, so you see these micro-identity lines, um, those are, you would see those much more prominent than sex, S-E-C-T-S, mm -hmm. yes. not S-E-C-T-S. <laughs> so, so how would, so uh, a Muslim from uh, the same ethnic group but different sex, they would be in the same congregation because they would. Uh, uh, what are you within Islam? What are you referring to by sex? So I guess, or, uh, Sunni, Sunni, Shia, Shia I guess. No. Any, anything, no. Because anything, that's that. just. Mm, by and large, they wouldn't be praying together okay. in any context. Okay. Because any of them wouldn't want to pray with the other. I mean, this uh, is. This is by and large. It does happen that people do pray together. And there's some, there are some congregations in which this happens. But especially in the context of Malaysia, where being Ahmadi and Shia is illegal, then you wouldn't have that because they would be kicked out from the mosque. 
or reported to the police or whatnot, so they would pray amongst themselves in somebody's house. Unless they were praying in a Sunni fashion, but then they're not apparently praying in any different way. Uh, within Christianity, um, you have those, um, uh, you have these, so you would have, you know, the, the Methodists, mm -hmm. and then the old fragmented, then you have the, the Catholics, as in, uh, in the US, you have the Southern Baptists, uh -huh. they have the Korean church, they have the Chinese church, and they have the Filipino church, and they have the white church, and they have the black church, and they're all part of the Southern Baptist. it's all the same, but they, they don't pray for us, because their liturgical traditions or approaches are different. Um, or the language they use is different. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I had to kind of take back off what you were saying with the different sects, with uh, especially the Sufis and the you said Sunnis and the Shias. Uh, what did you come across uh, in regards to those limitations, and especially the Constitution, when you spoke to it being specific to Islam? And like you said, some are even illegal. Uh, it's illegal. Mm -hmm. that parts of Islam is illegal, like what you just said. Uh, how did that lead to the further racial identities from that? Point four. Um, so my first interest in religious minorities come from working on Shia Muslims in Indonesia, Singapore, and Malaysia. Mostly Indonesia, but also Singapore and Malaysia. Um, and that's where, for the first time, I came across racial distinctions within Islam. Because being trained as an Islamic studies person, I am well brainwashed into the they did the Quranic precept in which there is no race difference with you know everybody is a brother or sister in religion, is a universal religion. Um, and then doing field work in Singapore I started realizing that there were uh, Shi'i North Indian groups, Shi'i Malay groups and Shi'i Arab groups. And they wouldn't commemorate, do any festivities together because their rituals are shaped differently. Um, so that plays out within each sect, uh, within each subgroup of Islam, all the same. It's just a, a reproduction of the model, if you wish. So um, it, it's just one thing. Thank you. Cool. Kira, I wanted, um, if I could push you a little bit towards some mm -hmm. uh, of the Southeast Asian cases. Tom already mentioned Myanmar, but you know, when you describe the Malay case, the Malaysian case, and the continuities of the, the British colonial past and, and the efforts to sort of consolidate the Malay pillar mm. and thereby, of course, separate them from the Chinese, um, and that plays a very important role in the politics as we've already discussed. But you look at a place like um, the Philippines or, or Thailand mm. where that's mm. very different. You have more of an integrationist model of course, there's some discrimination against Chinese, particularly recent immigrants, but basically you have um, integration, Chinese mestizos and Filipino Sino Thai mm -hmm. in, 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 in Thailand, it's also helped by the fact that religion doesn't prove a major obstacle. In, in, in Thailand, most uh, well, many Chinese are Buddhist, and uh, in the Philippines, many of them uh, are Christian. So that, that's kind of interesting. So then I want to bring you to Indonesia. Mm -hmm. So the interesting thing about Indonesia is that for a long time, and, and also from the perspective of the politics, it was seen as, as somewhat similar to the, the, the Malaysian case, where Chinese, although a much smaller minority, mm -hmm. were stigmatized, and in politically crucial moments, there were even pogrom-style attacks against them, most recently in 97, 98, right? Um, that seems to be changing mm -hmm. in Indonesia. Um, so my question at the end is, has Indonesia better than Malaysia escaped its colonial legacy? Um, that's a very good question. I mean, it's um, so the, the the comparison with Indonesia is very compelling in the sense that um, not not to play too much the colonial card, but the Dutch had a very different approach to um, racial classifications in Indonesia. I mean, I haven't done very extensive work, but the, the one thing that I feel very confident just taking, saying out of off my hat is um, the very category of being European in the Dutch East Indies was a cultural group rather than um, a phenotypical group. So you almost see a reverse. Being 
belonging to a certain racial group did not come with any specific religious connotation, but it came with a bunch of broader cultural baggage. So you could be, of course, Japanese after the Equality Treat of 1905, 1907. Uh, Japanese were considered European. Um, Indonesians who worked for the public administration, who proved that they could speak Dutch, and they wore shoes, and they wore shirts, and they had someone to sponsor them, they could apply to become European. And they might be Japanese, Sumatrans, Balkans. Um, so it was a, very, a much more flexible um, category. Mm -hmm. So I think that the, the colonial, let's say the colonial legacy was already different from, um, from the start. Um, but talking about the Chinese, I think that much of the, besides from changing political dynamics, and definitely the Chinese are more integrated, there is plenty of in, ethnic Indonesians who now want to go to Chinese schools and learn Chinese. And uh, it's increasingly common because that's where the money is, that's where the business ties are. And they know better than sending them to any other school. So if you have money and you're Indonesian ethnic, of Indonesia of sort, you might be sending your kids to a Chinese school. But also, what um, a colleague of mine has been working on for quite a few years is looking at Chinese Muslims and their integration, um, especially in Surabaya, but also other cities. And he does comparatively Indonesia and Malaysia. And I think his bottom line argument is that they are much more integrated in Indonesia as Muslims than they are in Malaysia. Because in Malaysia, you have even a couple of Chinese mosques where the ceremony is administered in Mandarin, going back to the language issue. Um, but in, in Indonesia, you don't have this. There is much more of an, maybe because the minorities are much less proportional, there is much more of a national program in a way, in which everything is in Indonesian. And there is, on that level, that's one of the things I'm looking at, as I mentioned earlier, is uh, language policies, is having a real national language and a national education system works for integration. I mean, there are now Chinese schools, but as also Indonesians, ethnic Indonesians are going to Chinese schools, you still have mingling. Part of the problem in Malaysia and Singapore is that the vernacular education is ethno or racial linguistic. So if you're, Tam if you're Indian, you will go to a Tamil school. If you're Chinese, you go to a Chinese school. If you're Malay, you go to a, to a Malay school for primary school. And then you do that language and you're surrounded by that kind of people. And so I think that Indonesia is much more integrated, even though we have seen a terrible history of stigmatization of the Chinese. As always being political, I mean, it's not that the rest is not political, but almost more a political expedient of the moment versus a systematized policy from since independence to isolate. And it's, it's very thin different. I don't think I'm able to, um, to express the nuance properly. But there, despite the segregation, the stigmatization, the marginalization of the Chinese in Indonesia has never been um, in attempt at channeling them as much as it has been in Malaysia and Singapore, right? In Malaysia. There is something different there. I need to be more sophisticated about Thank you for the question. What about generational change? Are you mm. also looking at it? I mean, you mentioned about uh, your new data about interracial marriages mm -hmm. within the same religion. Yeah. Uh, I mean, interracial marriages have happened practically because of the colonial you know, experience. Uh, and I guess it actually happens to a greater degree now. Mm -hmm. And are you looking at that too? Um, indirectly, in a way. Um, in the sense that definitely there is a change. I mean, inevitably there is a change. There are much more um, uh, inter interracial, same religion marriages now than there used to be. Way, way more now. Um, but the, the other thing is, uh, what I've been hearing a lot in Malaysia is really the, the sense of a, the older generation that keeps complaining how much society is being racialized. And uh, there was you know, the One Malaysia policy or project or whatever you want to call it. Um, so they were having a, uh, a public de 
not a public debate. In Malaysia, you have no public debate. But people were invited to City Hall to express their concerns and their ideas about Malaysian society, and whether it was united or fragmented. And you had all these older people who went to school in the 60s saying, I don't remember it being a problem going to, going to the canteen with my Malay friends or the Malays and with my Chinese friends, and each would take food from a different stall, we would sit down and eat together. Chinese New Year would always have Malay neighbors coming, and Malays would say, you know, when is Idofidia, we always have neighbors coming, and nobody would start asking, does that have pork? Is that halal? Is this, you know, is this, this, is this, that? But because society has changed, and the government has changed policies since, definitely since the, the late 60s, so much has changed, but even the education policies have changed. And so now you go to vernacular schools. Only primary schools now are vernacular, but that's when you start creating your initial um, social network. And so you speak one language and you're surrounded by one ethnic group. And then you're thrown into mixed um, uh, junior high schools. But it's um, so there, there are generational shifts for the better and for the worst. Um, I don't think that I would be able to just delineate it, but there are very interesting transformations between the younger generation and the older generation of how they relate to race, identity, religion, language, and food. I mean, which is a great way to look at it. So there are no... Oh, sorry. I'm uh, very interested in the Muslim population of Hong Kong, mm -hmm. and that increase if... And it's not clear the numbers don't quite add up, Again. Yeah, numbers never add up. Uh, because they're not official censuses, so each group, according to the government, uh, releases, um, oh no, sorry, I'm going in the wrong direction, um, releases um, projected or self determined numbers. Uh, this one here? No. This yeah, one's, this yeah. one and the one before. Yeah. How do we get one percent increase in just two years? On like mostly Indonesians. Mm -hmm. How come we have thirty thousand more Indonesians in two years? Domestic workers. Mm -hmm. so, just have two oh yeah, because the Filipinos are decreasing. The Philippine government is not allowing as many Filipinos to come here, and so it's increasing Indonesians. Increasing Indonesians that mostly come from East Java, and they tend, I don't know, nine point five out of ten are Muslims. Um, also, they're starting to have domestic workers coming from Bangladesh uh, as a plan B in case Indonesia shuts its doors because there are too many cases of patients. Um, and so, again, it's another um, Muslim contingent of workers um, coming in. It, it's fascinating. Is it Myanmar also being concerned? Uh, they recently closed it. They stopped doing it. They it was like a, a, a test, test run. And, uh, the Burmese government has decided to stop it a little bit. So, but the numbers are a little bit. Are <coughs> That's for sure. Right, well, if there are no further questions, again, many thanks, Kiara, and it's good to have you back.